Hi guys, uh, we are going to finish chapter one today. So this will be our last, um, I guess, lecture day for it. And then we'll have some different assignments and, and review things to do later on after we're done just going over all the lecture notes for the chapter. So just to start off, I know we've talked about uh, a lot of evolution in this chapter and this chapter pretty much is an introduction to evolution. We're going to finish section two today because uh, we started that last time. And then we are going to go through section three, which is really short. So we kind of already talked about uh, this slide a little bit. DNA is the universal genetic language common to all organisms. In other words, we talked about last time making a protein. And as we're making that protein, we start off at DNA in the nucleus. The DNA gets transcribed into RNA. That RNA leaves the nucleus, takes that message, and... Uh, transforms that message into a protein. Now, for other organisms, that DNA, that genetic code, is going to be the same or very, very uh, similar in order to make probably that protein, that same protein, or a protein extremely similar. And it's it's kind of crazy that the different species are have DNA that is so, I guess you could say, common to one another. Okay. So that's what we mean by the unity and the diversity of life is that the DNA is so similar that the proteins and the products that it produce are also very similar. So your book goes in and talks about fossils and things like that from years ago. Um, here's the dinosaur fossil here. So what they were getting at was starting up, let me move myself here, was starting up a conversation about uh, what Darwin found whenever he was on the um, Beagle going to uh, the Galapagos Islands. So when Darwin went to the Galapagos Islands, he was there for a very long time and he just studied all the different animals. You guys have probably heard of Darwin's finches, that uh, he studied those. And we're going to go over the finches, I got some pictures on them. But he studied like everything there. I know he spent a very long time even studying the orchids of, of, of I'm sorry, the orchids, uh, which is a type of plant. And he found all the orchids and looked at the colors and the different shapes of them. And he also used the orchids to talk about uh, his theory of evolution. So a lot of people uh, don't know this, but Darwin was actually not the first person to bring about this idea of evolution. Rather, Darwin was the first one to actually give a mechanism behind evolution. In other words, other people before Darwin guys said, oh yeah, there, there's evolution. Okay, Darwin was not the first person for this. But Darwin was the first one in order to say, hey, evolution does exist. Let me show you how it exists. And that's what separates Darwin from the previous scientists. So here was his book, guys, um, Darwin's book called The Origin of Species, and he published this. And the crazy thing is throughout this whole book, he never mentions evolution. He always refers to it as a means of natural selection instead of saying evolution. But he did offer, you know, a mechanism of evolution uh, able to occur. So here's a quick video on Darwin. Um, this video might be a little bit elementary, just in its graphics and stuff like that, but I kind of like the overall meaning of it, so I figured I'd show it to you guys. Myths and misconceptions about evolution. Let's talk about evolution. You've probably heard that some people consider it controversial, even though most scientists don't. But even if you aren't one of those people, and you think you have a pretty good understanding of evolution, chances are you still believe some things about it that aren't entirely right. Things like, evolution is organisms adapting to their environment. This was an earlier, now discredited theory of evolution. Almost 60 years before Darwin published his book, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck proposed that creatures evolve by developing certain traits over their lifetimes and then passing those on to their offspring. For example, 
He thought that because giraffes spent their lives stretching to reach leaves on higher branches, their children would be born with longer necks. But we know now that's not how genetic inheritance works. In fact, individual organisms don't evolve at all. Instead, random genetic mutations cause some giraffes to be born with longer necks, and that gives them a better chance to survive than the ones who weren't so lucky. Which brings us to survival of the fittest. This makes it sound like evolution always favors the biggest, strongest, or fastest creatures, which is not really the case. For one thing, evolutionary fitness is just a matter of how well suited they are to their current environment. If all the tall trees suddenly died out and only short grass was left, all those long-necked giraffes would be at a disadvantage. Secondly, survival is not how evolution occurs. Reproduction is. And the world is full of creatures like the male anglerfish, which is so small and ill-suited for survival at birth that it has to quickly find a mate before it dies. But at least we can say that if an organism dies without reproducing, it's evolutionarily useless, right? Wrong. Remember, natural selection happens not at the organism level, but at the genetic level. And the same gene that exists in one organism will also exist in its relatives. So a gene that makes an animal altruistically sacrifice itself to help the survival and future reproduction of its siblings or cousins can become more widespread than one that is solely concerned with self-preservation. Anything that lets more copies of the gene pass on to the next generation will serve its purpose. Except... Evolutionary purpose. One of the most difficult things to keep in mind about evolution is that when we say things like genes want to make more copies of themselves, or even natural selection, we're actually using metaphors. A gene doesn't want anything, and there's no outside mechanism that selects which genes are best to preserve. All that happens is that random genetic mutations cause the organisms carrying them to behave or develop in different ways. Some of those ways result in more copies of the mutated gene being passed on, and so forth. Nor is there any predetermined plan progressing towards an ideal form. It's not ideal for the human eye to have a blind spot where the optic nerve exits the retina, but that's how it developed, starting from a simple photoreceptor cell. In retrospect, it would have been much more advantageous for humans to crave nutrients and vitamins rather than just calories, but over the millennia during which our ancestors evolved, calories were scarce, and there was nothing to anticipate that this would later change so quickly. So, <clears throat> evolution proceeds blindly, step by step by step, creating all of the diversity we see in the natural world. All right, guys, so like I said, I like the video. Uh, its animations are a little bit elementary for us, but um, I think the overall meaning of it is pretty good. So going, just continuing on with evolution, here are three different birds. Uh, they all have different lifestyles, obviously. The penguin, probably the uh, most different from the other two. But they all actually have a common ancestor just because they are all birds. They all uh, throughout evolutionary history, at one time, they weren't all like one mash species, but they had a, they shared a common ancestor. And when that common ancestor may not have been as adapted to its environment, it might have split, not, not the individual, but that species split and diverged into a bunch of different species. Uh, they probably weren't exactly like these species we have here, but over time, they evolved and kept diverging to become into these species. So we talked about this one, I think on the first day of this chapter, guys. Um, more offspring are, are produced than survive. All right, that's, that's normal. But the ones with the, I'm gonna go to the next slide here, the ones with the more advantageous trait, okay? So we got a bunch of different um, organisms in a, in a species or in a population. We have tons of them. Not all of them are going to reproduce, but the ones with the best traits will produce, uh, will reproduce, okay? And then what they're gonna do is they're going to pass on their genes. Let me give you a human example of this, and I'll show you why humans 
are not a good example for this. So if we have, let's go back to like the 1970s and stuff like that. And I've seen people, older people, obviously a little older than me, that are still like stuck in the 70s and they'll have their like shirts unbuttoned like way too far down to make anyone feel comfortable. And there'll just be like mounds and mounds of chest hair just flying out of their shirt. And it's like, oh God, it's kind of gross. I hope they're not cooking food for me or something like that. Okay. But in the 70s, that was like normal. And that was like cool to, to have like mounds of chest hair flowing out. And what you do is you unbutton your shirt. And so everyone could see your luxurious, glorious chest hair. Ew. But anyway, um, as time went on now, it's like, okay, that's, that's not cool anymore. And it's not an advantageous trait, but women found men with chest hair in the seventies better looking than men without chest hair. I don't know why it's weird. It's, it's human like selection. And I think the big thing there is the media plays a role in just deciding what's cool and what's not cool. So in that example, back in the seventies, men with more chest hair would have reproduced and had more offspring. Yeah, I guess so. So do you guys see why humans are not a good example of this? Because we just select what is advantageous because we don't really act on natural selection. For instance, let me explain why we don't act on natural selection. Let's go to the African uh, desert. So you're in the you know Sahara and you see all these lions there. And there's a nice big pride of lions. And the lions are going to go hunt some zebras. I don't know. And one of the lions just gets kicked right in the ribs by a zebra. And the lion is probably not going to make it. It might, you know, live for maybe another week or so. But overall, it's going to die. What that lion's going to do is probably go out of the pride. It's going to leave the pride and it's going to die. Because it knows it's just going to bring that pride down. It's going to slow that pride down. And the pride is going to have to take care of that injured lion. Us as humans, we take a different approach. Okay, oh my goodness, you're hurt. Let's go to the hospital. We're going to make you better. Everything's going to be fine. Um, and you'll, you'll, you'll live much longer. Okay? We don't really act on natural selection because we make sure that everyone, you know, gets medical attention when they need it for the most part, right? So that's why humans are a bad example. But any kind of other species, like I just went over that lion one, it shows that they can uh, have natural selection acted upon them. Now, the lions, let's keep with the lions here, the advantageous traits, okay, well, maybe one lion's a little bit smarter than the others. Maybe one lion knows, okay, if I'm going to attack a zebra, I'm not going to go from behind where the zebra can buck up and kick me right in the ribs. I'm going to go from the side, okay, so the, the zebra can't harm me. Now, that lion that survives longer is going to reproduce, and it's going to pass on, for now, we'll say those smart genes onto the next generation, all right? So that's the difference between humans and animals when it comes to traits. Sorry, guys, I got a little long-winded on that slide there, but I think it was an important one. Okay, so we talked about this one already uh, with natural selection. I think I... I kind of went over all this in the last slide, but for most organisms, again, don't use humans as this because humans were horrible with this. The environment selects for what traits are, are beneficial. For example, if we have, let's say domestic cats, you guys have ever seen the hairless cats, they're kind of gross looking, but um, if we were in a cold environment, the environment would select for which cats would survive in domestic cats. If we would have a, a cat with fur on it, obviously that would be more advantageous for the cold environment than the hairless cat. That hairless cat, there's no warmth, it's going to die. All right, hopefully that makes sense. Here is a camouflage one, and we're gonna go back to the mice one. They go back to it at the end of the chapter, from the beginning of the chapter, that mice example. But here's another one with camouflage, guys. You can see the bird is eating some of these bugs, and some of them are a little more camouflaged to the environment than others. You guys can see the white ones are being eaten because the bird can easily see them. And then over time, those white ones decrease in their uh, frequency in the population. And then the black ones reproduce, the dark ones reproduce. And now we have more of those in the environment that the bird has a little more trouble seeing. 
All right, if we were to compare, uh, and these are called homologous traits, we go over these a little bit later on in the year. If we were to compare our forelimb or our forearm, okay, um, or our calf part of our leg to that of the legs of a horse or the flipper of a whale or the wing of a bat, you guys could see that, no, not the external structure, but the internal structure is going to be very similar with the bone structure, with the amount of bones, with how the bones uh, are put together. Okay, This shows us that, hey, maybe we have a common ancestor. Now, I'm not saying that, especially with the whale, I'm not saying that, okay, with the whale, Mr. Communel is saying that we are related to whales. No, 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 no. Sometime, and this could have been 100 million years ago, or even longer than that, we may have shared a common ancestor with whales, okay? Um, and, and like I said, guys, that's way, way, way far back, okay? So it, it's kind of cool. And how we came up with the whale theory was that if you guys have ever seen uh, the internal structure of a whale, at one time the whale actually had back legs and they still have some of the internal structures to show the back legs were connected, but they didn't use them anymore. So why have the blood flow go to an area that's not even used so that the whales over time got rid of the uh, back legs. This also tells us that whales probably once were land dwellers instead of sea dwellers, uh, which is kind of crazy. Okay, you could see a whale walking. Uh, yeah, that'd be nuts. But um, at one time they entered the water and that's why whales actually still need to breathe. They need to come up for air. When a whale is born, so we got a baby whale, the mother whale actually has to get underneath the baby whale, push it up to the um, top of the water and get it up so it can breathe, which is kind of cool. It's a nice motherly duty, you know. It's like, all right, let's go breathe. Okay, and then the mother whale can let the baby whale come back down. Okay. All right, so we are almost done with Darwin guys we're gonna get into the finches like I told you um, this is talking about divergent evolution so we have Darwin going to the Galapagos Islands and he's studying all these finches and there was a bunch of different species of finches and finches are birds guys just so you, in case you don't know um, he kinda had this theory that okay maybe it's a one, uh, one species kind of bird and then that one species maybe needed to diverge into different species based on the needs of the environment and here's what he found so he pretty much from the last slide guys said we had a common ancestor of finch right here and the environment was changing on the different islands and it could have been guys the Galapagos Islands were, were one island at one time and then that island started to split off into different islands and all these different islands started to have different foods. So at one time, try to picture this in your heads, at one time, probably all of these islands had a bunch of different birds. And all these different birds ate different things. Now, if we look here, we got this guy up here, and he eats insects. Well, maybe one of the islands didn't have insects. So this bird, either A, flew to a different island, hopefully he did that, right? Or B, he stayed at that island, couldn't find anything to eat, and he died. So that island no longer had insect-eating birds because there was no insects, all right? Um, but going down here, you could see this, this big guy down here, okay? He probably, it says here, um, eats seeds. I'm like, we're not talking about little seeds, guys. I'm not talking about like, sunflowers and things like that. I'm talking about like like walnuts and things like that. Big things where he would have to crack them open with that beak. All right. Um, but again, if this guy was on an island and there was no seeds, well, he's either A, going to fly to a different area or B, he's going to die. So over time, what happened with these finches is as they developed their different beaks and became accustomed to eating certain things, all right, the islands changed because only certain birds would be on certain islands based on what food was available at that island. All right, so that was Darwin's finches. 
And that is the end of section two, guys. Section three is just a kind of overview of science and uh, some different reasoning skills. So we're going to go over that really quickly. Uh, this one, I think you guys have been hitting this in seventh grade. Science means just to know. Inquiry, uh, this is trying to, I hate to use the word in the definition, but inquire on different things, like see how things work and make observations and things like that. So you guys collect data every day of your life, okay? Whether it's right now, you are collecting data, okay, Mr. Comino's going over a lot of AP Bio quickly. That's, that's, da that's data right there, guys. Um, there's two different types of data. There's qualitative and quantitative. Pretty much, th these are very simple. Qualitative is non-number related, right? And quantitative is number related. Think of quantitative. You see the number, or the word quantity right in there. Quantity deals with numbers. Anything that deals with numbers, if you guys ever see a number, it's quantitative, all right? If there's no number in there, if we're talking about like, I don't know, um, the baseball is white, that's qualitative data. Um, the runner is running fast, that's qualitative. But if we say the runner is running at, I don't know, 10 miles an hour, now that switches because we put the number in there, that switches to quantitative data. So there's your, your difference between them. Um, here was, if you look at the previous slide, uh, Jane Goodall, she did different observations with chimpanzee behavior. Um, that would all be collecting qualitative data. She's not putting numbers on it, all right? Unless she monitored like how much food they were eating, then she could put a number on it, but all hers was more behavior related. So she was collecting uh, qualitative data. So two different types of reasoning skills. We have inductive and deductive reasoning skills. And we're gonna go over those real quickly. Um, so, in order to draw a conclusion, guys, we need to make a large number of observations. And I'm not saying like just you. So like if you're in a lab uh, doing something, you might have collected, I don't know, a thousand different conclusions on the same data, all right? In order to get a like firm conclusion on something, you can't just do it. You gotta have like other people do thousands upon thousands upon thousands of different things. Uh, let's go back to, if you guys uh, have heard the story of Newton under the apple tree, and then the apple fell and hit him in the head, and he's like, oh my goodness, I discovered gravity. Because that's what Newton sounds like, right? Um, did Newton actually have an apple fall on his head? Probably not, okay? What he was doing was creating a story so he can have his uh, theory of, at the time, theory of gravity, okay, be easily understood by the people of that time, all right? So what happened here was probably he was maybe in his lab and he just kept throwing things around. He's like, oh, look, every time I throw something up, it comes down. And he probably did this thousands upon thousands upon thousands of times. And the other scientists, hey, check this out. Throw this in the air. It's going to come down, you know. And that's what created his law of gravity. It wasn't just an apple falling on his head one time. Okay, and then also when we're doing these um, different things for science, we got to make sure that we are only having one variable. So he was throwing, let's see, this apple up in the air and catching it. Well, if that apple, let's say, was coming down and the wind kicked up, that add another variable. Okay, you throw the apple up, it comes down, but if the wind is there, it's going to kick it to the side. So it's like, oh, instead it's it's over here, uh, or if the wind's blowing blown that way it's it's over there okay so we have to have a bunch of different uh, tests to do in science and then we also have to have a try to really keep the variables limited so that way our results aren't skewed but anyway um, I'm gonna go over inductive reasoning while going over deductive I think it'll make things a little bit easier um, for you guys so we're gonna go from both at once um, whenever we get to deductive reasoning. So with a hypothesis, guys, you're going to learn in AP Bio that a hypothesis is completely different than any other hypothesis you have had throughout your whole science career, okay? We're going to put numbers in our data in order to determine 
if our hypothesis is accepted or rejected. A hypothesis for you guys is no longer going to be an educated guess, all right? In other words, let's just stick with Newton. If I throw an apple up in the air, my hypothesis is that it's going to come down. Those hypotheses are gone. Um, that was like your seventh grade hypothesis. And then probably when you got to around ninth grade, you had the if-then hypothesis, where if I throw the apple in the air, then it will come back down due to the law of gravity. Okay, again, that was ninth grade. Now we're actually going to be um, testing hypotheses and putting numbers to them. And we're going to have a nice big table later on in the year. And it's going to tell us if our hypothesis is accepted or rejected by using numbers and math in it. All right, so I told you guys we were gonna come back to inductive reasoning. So there's two different types of reasonings. There's inductive and deductive. And there is a very small but big difference between the two. So deductive reasoning, okay, I'm gonna start with that one, is when we go from a general statement and then we get very specific on it. So here's an example of it, okay? Um, all calico cats are female, okay? And that's true. Unless there's a genetic mutation in the cats, all calico cats are female, okay? So if you see a calico cat walking down the street or whatever, you go, oh, look, there's a calico cat. That fat cat is female, all right? So that is deductive reasoning. You're seeing a calico cat and you're saying, hey, that's female. You're going from very general to a specific statement saying that calico cat is female. Uh, inductive goes the opposite. It goes from specific to general. And I think this example will kind of make everything a little bit easier for you guys. So let's say you have a bag. Um, you can't see inside the bag, all right? But you start pulling things out of the bag. And you reach your hand in this bag and you say, oh, look, I pulled out a penny and you put the penny to the side. And then you reach in this bag again. Again, you're not looking in the bag. You reach in the bag and you pull out something else and say, oh, hey, a penny. And you put that to the side. You reach in the bag again. This is getting repetitive, right? You pull out a penny. Oh, look, another penny. You put it to the side. This is um, inductive reasoning, okay? So what we're doing here is we are starting with something very specific. Oh, look. A penny and then your conclusion to this is hey I don't have to pull out anything else from this bag I can assume that this bag is full of pennies okay we're going from very specific saying oh look a penny one penny one penny one penny and then we're going to something a little more uh, general saying hey this whole bag is filled with pennies that's the difference between deductive reasoning and inductive so Moral of the story, guys, here's what you need to know. Deductive reasoning is starting with a general statement and then getting more specific, okay? Inductive is the opposite. You're going from a very specific statement and going to something general, all right? Um, here's another example, guys, and your book goes over this with a flashlight and it's not working and stuff like that. So you can make different hypotheses and these are not gonna be like the hypotheses we're going to be using later in the year. Uh, these are very general ones, but hey, my flashlight doesn't work. Okay, well, why doesn't it work? Let's do different hypotheses. Batteries are dead. Okay, let me change the batteries. No, that didn't work. Um, hypothesis number two. Okay, well, maybe the bulbs ran out. Okay, let me change that. You may have to, in your, your different um, lab experiments, when we get back to in person, you might have to, you know, have your hypotheses they might both not work, and then you might have to test other hypotheses. But the goal of any hypothesis is to make sure that it is testable. You can test it, okay? Um, there are, let me go, I'm gonna skip this one, guys. There are a bunch of hypotheses you guys can make for any lab. You just have to make sure that you can test them and you can falsify them. Later on in life, guys, you guys will have um, car insurance, house insurance, renter's insurance, all these different, different insurances 
to make sure that, hey, if something happens to your property that you're going to be covered and someone else is going to pay for it and you don't have to pay a lot of money to do whatever um, to fix it. So there's one statement, and I'm not getting religious here, guys, but there's one statement that insurance companies will make called act of God. Well, I always hated that statement because they can't test that and they can't falsify that anything is an act of God. And sometimes under act of God, the insurance company will be like, oh, that was an act of God. We don't have to pay for your stuff. Well, okay, show me how you can test that that was an act of God or show me how you can falsify that that was an act of God. It always, uh, you know, kind of got to me a little bit. But make sure, guys, you know that a hypothesis must be two things, testable and able to be falsified. Your book then goes back to the mouse um, or mice on the beach and on the inland thing, uh, the example we went over at the beginning of the chapter. Okay, So in this third bullet, what accounts for the match between the coat colors and the mice and the color of the sand or soil and their habitats? Well, you know, those different colors of the fur matched the different colors of the sand and the soil. And we found out at the beginning that with these different colors, we're going to have the different mice. But with those different, let me go back actually, with these different colors, guys, that doesn't mean that only the light mice live on the sand and only the dark mice live on the inland, all right? Instead, what happened was the, the predators, and I'm not going to rehash this a lot, the predators were able to see different mice. They were able to see these light tan mice on the inland and these dark mice on the beach. So... A group of students, guys, actually got together with their uh, teacher, and this wasn't too long ago, and they actually made a bunch of different mice. Um, yeah, they, I guess, like went crazy with it, but they made all these different models of mice, and they put them on the inland and put them um, on the, like, uh, sand, and they did all different colors, and they watched the predators trying to eat these silicon mice, which obviously they, they didn't taste like regular mice, but they did notice that over time, okay, they looked at the predation rate. Now, this is not how many are left. This is how many got, I guess, attacked. Um, but they were uh, watching these mice in the different areas, and they noticed that in the beach, obviously the dark mice, they had a high predation rate. They were pretty much getting eaten now they were silicon so they really you know didn't but um and then on the inland the light mice they weren't able to camouflage so they had a higher predation predation rate okay so that was their findings all right last few slides here controlled experiment guys in a controlled experiment okay we want to make sure we're only testing one variable in the mice one, we were uh, testing their fur color to see which ones blended in with the environment more and which ones got um, preyed on more. So we want to make sure that in any experiment as well, we have a control group. Easiest way for me to explain this to you, let's say for plants, we're planting plants and we're testing different fertilizers, okay? And we're going to test all these different fertilizers to see which ones are going to make the plant grow the highest. We want to keep everything the same. We want to keep the water level the same. We want to keep uh, the amount of sunlight the same. The only thing we want to change is the uh, different soils, different fertilizers we use. So we always want to make sure in any experiment we have a control group. And what that control group does is to make sure everything else is okay in our experiment. We know that you know soil, regular soil, should make the plant grow. So our control group would be just regular soil for this because we know that the plant should grow. If the plant is not growing in the regular soil that we are 100% sure uh, that the plant should grow in, we know that something else is wrong with our experiment. So that's what the control group is used, to, used for, to make sure that your whole experimental process is good. And if something is wrong with the control group, well, then something is wrong with your whole experimental design. Okay, in a theory, guys, we're going to have a 
hypothesis that has been tested and tested and tested and tested over and over and over again. And in how many times it has been tested, we are going to come up with pretty much the same result. Now, sometimes guys, we're going to have something called an outlier, okay? Now, in this experiment, I'm just gonna do a quick line graph here, all right? We're gonna go down, we're gonna go over, all right. And we're gonna have, I'm not gonna draw these points in guys, but we're gonna have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of, of points. And let's say that, here's our, here's our points here, okay? And do one, I'm just gonna do a few. Okay. And then we're gonna have, pretend there's like a thousand here, okay? And then we're gonna have one here, or we're gonna say one here, okay? This one is just a one point. This one is just one point. All of these here in this nice line are like a thousand points, okay? So we test the hypo that's hypothesis and we get a nice linear data line there, okay? These guys here, this one here and this one here, those are called your outliers, okay? Now, as long as we have enough points, as long as we have like thousands upon thousands of, of hypotheses, uh, tests that are credible and fit our data, those two outliers probably aren't gonna be a big deal. Maybe there was an experimental design flaw in those two. Maybe the people doing it just uh, missed something, okay? Hopefully they can account for what went wrong in those two, um, but our goal was to make sure, guys, that we have so much data here that those two don't matter, okay? And then as long as we have that amount of data, we can make a theory off of it. It's not quite a scientific law yet, like the law of gravity, but um, a theory is much more credible than just a hypothesis because it's been tested so many times. All right. Um, this slide, guys, I'm not going to go over with you because it only sets up for the next slide here, which is talking about technology and science and the relationship between the two. In order for science to go in a specific way, we need to have a demand for that. And right now, it's technology, okay? Um, and that's applying, you know, whatever science we, ha we need to the need of the people, okay? Um, so it's just like supply and demand right now. You guys know everything going on with like different cars, with Tesla, uh, Apple products, computer products. They're getting more advanced, especially like your phones with, you know, you have your face that's able to unlock your phone now. And that's all science. It's being used to make up all this technology. All right, guys, that's the end of chapter one. We're going to kind of do a little bit of a review on this next time. Uh, and then later on, we will have our quiz for chapter one. Have a good day, guys.